Thanks so much, Lindy. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so glad to have you here for uh, the newest, the latest installment in our Disability Thrive Initiative webinar series. Uh, today's webinar is on the changing role of the workforce supporting people with disabilities. Um, as we know, throughout the pandemic, um, there's been incredible innovation and change in the way services have been delivered. And the real backbone of all this transition and transformation has really been the direct support professionals who have continued to adapt to meet the needs of their clients and the individuals uh, in, in need of support. And, and truly, it's, it's uh, a great honor to have with us today um, uh, both a presenter and panelists to speak to some of this transition, some of the challenges, opportunities, um, and, and different things that uh, people have experienced as we've gone through this trying time. Uh, today's webinar is going to talk about the shift from providing care to supporting independence and community engagement. Um, we're going to talk about how we can develop our DSP workforce through competency-based education rather than training, and, and ultimately creating a culture that supports both staff recruitment and retention for the long haul for our system. Um, so we've got a great, like I said, we have a great presenter um, and a great panelist. I am going to start by introducing you to our presenter today. Um, his name is John Raphael. He is the Director of Educational Services from the National Alliance of Direct Support Professionals in New York. John is a, is a great partner to the Disability Thrive Initiative, and he's going to kick us off with a great presentation today before we get into a panel conversation. So with that, uh, I sit, kick it over to you, John. Thanks so much. Mary, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lendi. Thank you, our incredible interpreters. Um, I'll try to talk slow because I'm from New York and we New Yorkers, you know, we talk a little fast, so I'll, I'll have mercy. <laughs> anyway, uh, this, I've been so excited uh, for the last couple of days preparing for today's uh, webinar uh, because of the panel we're going to have. We've got some really cool people that are gonna, I think, drive home, drive home the importance of seeing our direct support workforce in a different light. Uh, COVID-19 did a lot to show us how valuable uh, direct support professionals are, and we're gonna talk about that, but there's, there, there's more that we have to talk about. And that's what I'm gonna kind of set the stage with why COVID, kind of lifted a veil, lifted a curtain, and showed the world how valuable uh, direct care, direct support professionals are. And what was really interesting, and I know California struggled with this, as did many states, were direct support professionals essential or not? Now, come on. Yes, <laughs> we know they were. We've always known they were. So we're going to just, again, set a table for the next 20, 25 minutes. Um, I'm going to show you and share with you some important information about how we can kind of put our actions and our, our, our money where our mouth is to improve the direct support workforce, certainly in California. But my job is to promote and elevate direct support professionals all over North America. So uh, again, I'm the Director of Educational Services at the National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals. I started in the field of direct support back in 1986 when I was 20 years old. Um, we're just gonna leave it at that because I don't wanna talk about it anymore. I don't wanna talk about my age. My goodness, 20, oh, I was 20 years old in 1986. Get your calculators out. Anyway, um, I'm honored to be with you. Let's get to it. Next slide, please. So the National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals, we're so happy to be partners with, with all of the, the, uh, the folks involved today. Um, we're really about one thing and one thing only. It's elevating the direct support profession to where it should be, where it should always have been, which is at the top of the professional food chain. And what I mean by that, oftentimes direct support professionals are not necessarily uh, given the kind of respect that other professionals, such as social workers, nurses, occupational therapists, physicians, you know, the list goes on. Oftentimes, 
direct support professionals aren't given that valuable status. Even in the worst case scenarios, they're disrespected. And we can't have that. We can't have that. And our organization, through several things that we do, we elevate the profession. We do it through all kinds of different training and educational curriculum and, and materials that we, we offer our, our disability community. We do um, policy work. We're doing more and more of that. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, some of the things we're, we're now able to do in Washington, D.C. that we weren't able to do 10 years ago because we've grown and we're able to be able to do that kind of policy work with the people that make laws and, and create funding and create our regulations for our field, right? We're going to talk about that. So we do that. And we, we also do some certification. We, we have a, a national certification program. And I'll talk about that briefly. That becomes, again, one of the cornerstones of retention and recruitment for direct support professionals. I'll, I'll be certain, certainly talking about that. Um, I could spend the whole hour and a half just talking about the, the certification process for direct support professionals, but we're not going to do that. So next slide, please. So, and you can hit it one more time. There we go. Uh, look at that. Isn't that beautiful? That's called a Venn diagram for those of you that can see it, for those of you that can't see it for whatever reasons. It's three circles and they intersect. And these three circles are what the National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals is all about. Because in the middle of those three circles, in the middle of that Venn diagram is two words, quality support. You're gonna see in just a few minutes, direct support professionals and some of the people that they serve and they support. And what we're going to do at the, 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 the last part of this webinar is basically prove that definition that's kind of on the left side of your screen. That definition, if you get an email from anybody from the National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals, that's our tagline. And it, it's a quote from our founder, uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. Um, obviously the Kennedy family, they've contributed so much to direct support, uh, believe it or not, but what they've done, they've contributed so much to improving the lives for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities really throughout the world based on the initiatives since the Kennedy administration back in the 60s. John Jr., John John, John Kennedy Jr., he was all about the workforce. He was all about the direct support professionals. And this is his quote, quality. We have to define it one place and one place only, and that is at the point of interaction between staff members and the people that they support, people with disabilities. And we're gonna see that interaction in, in, in real time in just a few minutes. And I can't wait, can't wait to get to that. So let's, let's move to the next slide, please. Talked about this before, that when this horrible pandemic hit last year, and my goodness, I, I don't know about you, for me, it feels like it's been going on like decades. But it hasn't. It's been, what, 18 months or so, right? When it hit, when we realized that particularly people with developmental disabilities, intellectual disabilities, certain physical disabilities, were at even a greater risk for really bad repercussions if they get COVID, what happened, we saw immediately in real time, how vital direct support professionals are. Not that we didn't know that. I think probably most of us on this webinar, I'm certain most of us that are uh, certainly on the panel, I think we, uh, we always knew that. We, we know direct support professionals are valuable. We know they're vital. We know they're essential. But look what we've, look what this is a quote from our executive director, Joseph Macbeth. COVID-19 has lifted the veil on a decades long, decades long systemic failure to support the most important resource in the disability services sector, and that's the direct support workforce, which you've been neglected for far too long, direct support professionals. I know it because I was one. And I know it because 
I interact with them every day. And that neglect has to stop. And some of what we're going to talk about today is about how we can improve that. So COVID-19 left us with an ugly gift. And next slide, please. Because there's lots of confusion over the role of direct support. What do direct, I mean, many of you, you might even not be called direct support professionals, and that's okay, but we have to we have to identify what direct support is. We have something called an identity crisis because many of you, if you do call yourself a direct support professional, that's wonderful. But I think the larger society doesn't know what you do. They think you're like a, like a nurse's aide. They think you're kind of like a, maybe a home health aide. There's nothing farther from the truth. Um, you're not. You know, you, you are direct support professionals, particularly that work in the intellectual developmental disabilities field. The skills, the competencies, the ethics are unbelievably complex. And we would argue, not that CNAs and home health, home health aides aren't, and they have complicated jobs and complex jobs. Of course they do. We would argue that direct support professionals, especially in community-based organizations, and do that, and those that do community-based work, their skill sets, they exceed, I would argue, social work skills. I'm a social worker. That's what my that's what my license is, that's what my profession is. I would argue, in reflecting on my days back doing direct support and certainly knowing what direct support professionals do in 2021, you are, you are matched as as what professionals do based on on what a professional is identified as. So this confusion that we have and we've had and the ugly gift that COVID brought us is that we now know, my goodness, are you essential? Yeah, like, yeah, because without you, without you, without direct support professionals, we would have lost a lot more people to COVID-19. I. Do I have science and facts to back that? No, but I do have some survey results and some statistics about the role that direct support professionals played in the lives of people with disabilities. And without their, without their support, promoting physical and emotional and, 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 and certainly psychological well-being during this awful time, a lot more people with disabilities would have been probably given to COVID. Are you healthcare workers? Well. During this period of time, you sure were. We had to deal with understanding personal protective equipment, temperature taking, uh, all of that stuff that we, we're all, we now, most of us know really well, but direct support professionals really, really got into it and had to rise to an occasion to be that healthcare worker. Um, because oftentimes it was the direct support professional that was the only person that was perhaps allowed to be with the people that they're supporting in a, whether it's the, a group home setting, a supported living apartment, well, day programs are largely shot, but hazard pay, were you eligible for that? That had to be fought for. It still has to be fought for, why? Because you're not recognized as a quote unquote, bona fide professional in the eyes of the Department of Labor in the United States. Not yet, we're gonna talk about that in a second. We're gonna get there. Here's the thing, anonymous, Anonymity. Direct support professionals are very anonymous because people don't understand what they do. And here we go. This is the, this is the, this is, I'm going to get a little controversial. All right, everybody. And I want to get controversial. There's kind of a, a, a meme that's, that was going around during COVID times and still once in a while goes around. Are direct support professionals heroes? Are they saints? Are they angels? Well, I would, yeah. I mean, doing some heroic stuff absolutely during this pandemic, without a doubt. But if you go to this next slide, please go to the next slide. That thing on the left, it says direct support professional because badass miracle worker isn't an official job title. Well, I'll tell you right now, you know, it's, you know what else is an official, isn't an official job title? Direct support professional. It doesn't exist in, in the eyes of the United States Department of Labor or State Departments of Labor. 
So, yes, I think we're all aware of the amazing things that DSPs have done and do and will continue to do. But this other quote comes from a person that receives supports from a direct support professional and his take on it, Mike Irvin is his name. We saw this last year and it spoke to us in volumes. I'm gonna read it. Heroes, saints and angels, listen to this folks. The canonization, and for those of you that aren't familiar with canonization, it's, it's basically making a human being into a saint, largely in, in Catholic religion. So the canonization of direct care workers is supposed to be high praise, but it's really a reflection of how profoundly their work is misunderstood and devalued. Now, bear with me here. It's a deep disrespect cleverly disguising itself as an equally deep respect. And it begins with the notion, here we go, that helping disabled people execute our daily bodily, domestic, and community functions is some of the dirtiest of dirty work. It's like ministering to the untouchables, literally. That's powerful. I think that's one of the best quotes that came out of 2020 because it's exactly what we need to get at for the rest of this webinar. Direct support professionals aren't heroes. They're not saints. They're not angels. They're professionals and they, needed to, they need to be treated as that. And until we can create certain things and do certain things, not only in our organizations, which that, that we can, and we have been doing, and we'll help you do. But we also have to look at that large macro level, the policy level, direct support professionals, the time has come where you need to be given professional respect, remuneration, and authority. And we believe that time is very close. So next slide, please. One thing, and this is so vital, and I think maybe our panelists can maybe attest to this later on. During this time, the stress, the hours, the vulnerability, um, the fear, the anxiety that has been put on the shoulders, into the hearts, into the heads of direct support professionals, and certainly the people they support, has been probably one of the most significant traumas that we've seen this profession have to face. This has been an unbelievably harrowing, difficult time to do direct support. But I'll tell you right now, the praise and the things that you see heroes work here. And yes, that is that deserved during this time without a doubt. Our issue with it at the National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals, not that we don't believe direct support professionals are doing great things. There's a, there's a disconnect. You're not paying them. It's not your fault as a provider organization. That's a policy issue. You're not giving them authority. That's not your fault as a provider organization because how are you gonna give somebody that isn't certified to do a profession, how can you really give that authority, a professional authority? We're gonna talk about that in a second here. But we have to support, emotionally support direct support professionals beyond all this other practical stuff we're gonna talk about in the upcoming years. This trauma is gonna stay with us and we need it. We need to make sure our direct support professionals, we've got their back. So next, next slide. There are some things that we are going to do. This, we call it the silver lining, right? Of, of, of or the ugly gift that comes with something like a pandemic or any kind of crisis, right? But this one particularly, this has given us at the National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals some, some, some power, some horsepower to get something called the Standardized Occupational Classification put through the United States Department of Labor. And what that means, long story short, when direct support professional is a bona fide title recognized by the U.S. Department of Labor, 
we can then begin to give the Department of Labor and the state's Department of Laborers data about this workforce, wage, practice information, um, help the Department of Labor understand the competency sets, the code of ethics that's involved with doing direct support. When we do that, that's when the funders, that's when like uh, organizations, the big agencies like CMS and, and HHS and the federal government, that's when they'll begin to see that, my goodness, direct support is indeed a profession. Um, and indeed, we need to treat it as such with certification, education, development, money. So we're doing this. Um, it's probably the most important thing we're doing on your behalf um, as a national organization that understands the provider issues with, um, with the direct support workforce crisis. So if you want more information about any of this, at the end, you'll, you'll get my email address and you can certainly contact me and the folks at NADSP. This is critical, standardized occupational classification or occupational code. We're working on it. Next slide, please. Another thing that since COVID has hit, many organizations have reached out to us. To we need help. We need help with recruitment and retention. Part of this webinar is that's what this is about, really talking about how do we retain these precious direct support professionals? How do we get them in our doors? How do we meet them up with the people we support? Um, one way to do this is to make sure within your organization, you are giving expectations for this role. These expectations, all of them, our whole certification process, what we will lobby the United States Department of Labor about is that direct support professionals have specific competencies and a code of ethics that when they perform to that degree, of the, to those expectations of all these competencies, to this code of ethics, you're gonna have good outcomes for people with disabilities. You're gonna have staff retention. You will get people to come through your doors. If word gets out on the street that your organization ultimately provides lots of valuable feedback about the profession of direct support versus, hey, we have a really great place to work. Uh, we have a sign-on bonus. Um, come and work for us and we'll show you how it's done. That can't work anymore. That's not sustainable, but that's how a lot of organizations have to get direct support professionals in the door. And I'm not criticizing anybody for that, but we've got to, when you get them in the door, put on the other side of the door, right out front, what you expect. And what you can expect are the competencies and the code, but how you can expect that from direct support professionals is if your organization buys into and understands the power of these two, these two things. And by the way, these two things cost nothing, nothing. You can download them right now. You can download them after the, this webinar and look at them. And maybe some of you do use them for, for evaluation of staff, for, uh, uh, for, for teaching direct support professionals about this work. Um, I hope you do. Um, if you don't, we can help you with that. So. Very critical. Next slide, please. We are promising since this pandemic hit, um, and we're getting, we're getting word from the federal government that this particular administration, the Biden administration, is very sympathetic and very friendly to not only the disability uh, community, but the workforce issues. There, I think there's enough people in this administration that get it. And one of the things that is going to be coming our way, we do know, is increased funding. How it's going to happen via the legislation, the legislation of all the funding in the states, that's complicated. Goodness knows how that's going to work out. But we do know that there is a push to improve the workforce and the issues in and around the direct support workforce. And one thing, one thing that an organization can do, not to... Not to say you're, you're not doing this in your organizations, but they have to be solid. They have to be rooted in those competencies and the code of ethics. But to create 
career ladders and lattices. Career ladders and lattices. And what we mean by that, very simply, make it so that direct support professionals can move ahead. I'm not going to say move up in the organization, because that denotes that if you move up from a direct support professional position, that, okay, you know, you're moving out of something that is lowly. Couldn't be farther from the truth. No. What we say, make career ladders and lattices in your organizations based on the proficiency, the competence, the skills, the, the actual the desires of what direct support professionals want to do with the people that you support. Match direct support professionals with people that you support. I think our panel in a few minutes, we're going to see people that have been matched, that are able to work together. That's so important. There's so many elements of what to do in an organization to create what to create that we're not so much concerned about recruitment. Yes, we get it. We get it. We want to focus more on retention. And when we go into organizations for technical assistance and for training, we focus on retention because retaining direct support professionals, that's going to actually help your recruitment. Um, I wish we had more time to talk about that, but the reality is recruiting strategies are important but retention strategies we feel are more vital. And some of those strategies are to create positions within your organization where direct support professionals can shine. You don't want to put a direct support professional that's not versed at supporting somebody perhaps that, uh, on the autism spectrum with somebody on the autism spectrum. Maybe this direct support professional works better helping people you know, with physical functions and, and, and activities of daily living. Match them up. I know, that, I know that sounds like a luxury, but trust me, trust me, we do have some evidence where direct support professionals will stick around longer if they're doing what they like to do, and on top of that, rewarded with, for that. As for money and remuneration and compensation for all these things, um, that's a bigger policy issue. That's not your, it is your issue, but it's not something that we necessarily can can uh, can. can can battle and can win. That has that has to be a policy level, federal and state level uh, uh, concern. And I wish we could improve uh, uh, wages for direct support professionals. We and we're going to be working on that, but we're not going to do that till we get that occupational classification. In our strong opinion. Next, please. Next slide, please. Um, we do have, I spoke about it briefly, I'm not going to go into it. We have a nationally validated certification program at the Electronic Badge Academy, it's called, the eBadge Academy. We've had it now, it's, it's going on its third year. Our eBadge Academy is rooted in the CMS competencies for direct support workers in the United States, cross-sector meaning that if you're working with children, if you're working with adults, if you're working with alcohol substance abuse, if you're working with the elderly, CMS, the, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, they have a set of competencies for the long-term care workforce. These badges and this certification program that we have um, is about how to direct support professionals, how do they earn competency and how do they get credit for being competent? How can they be certified? How do we know they're good at what they do? It's not going to be through a test. It's not going to be through, you know, uh, somebody being called an angel because they're good and they have good personalities and they, they, they're, they're nice people. We No, that's not sustainable. We have to have some mechanism to certify and credential direct support workers. We're the only, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for us, I don't know, we don't know, but it's the only real national certification for direct support professionals out there that's based on competencies. And we want to push this. We, 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 we're dependent on providers to invest in this. We want to look again to states to invest in this and make this something that can be a, a, a obtainable and give you funding as providers, as direct support professionals to achieve uh, a credential. Again, that's a whole other webinar, whole other story, but when you talk about recruitment and retention, 
certification has to be somewhere in that mix. Some kind of, not saying licensure, but some kind of credential for what direct support professionals do. Not unlike certified nurses aides, home health aides, licensed practical nurses. So see where that's going. So next slide, please. Lastly, in terms of some of the things that we're doing uh, to promote this direct support workforce, we know the demographics. The demographics of the intellectual and developmental disability workforce in the United States, the majority are women and women of color and black women. And we can't deny the fact that there is systemic and institutional racism that exists in this society. It does. And it, and it filters into and impacts this particular workforce critically. Um, again, I wish I had more time to get into some of the statistics that we have and data that we have uh, 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 accumulated over the course of three surveys that we did in conjunction with the University of Minnesota. But I'll tell you right now, the inequalities and the inequities towards black and women of color and, 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 and all direct support professionals of color and, and, and black direct support professionals is, is vast. That can't, that can't be. We've got to level that playing field. We have to stand up against racism in the workplace. We have to understand that the wage, the earning potential for direct support professionals should not be based on their race and their color. Um, so these are some of the things that given the COVID-19 pandemic, we kind of witnessed. And we said, we have to stand for certain things as an organization that elevates direct support professionals. And things like career ladders, making sure competencies and the ethics are, are ingrained in organizational cultures, making sure that credentialing is available, making sure that racial equity is happening in our workforce. These are the things we're fighting for, and they've been put to the top of our list in terms of what we are offering to, to organizations and certainly to direct support professionals as to what can be the things that can retain direct support professionals. What are the things that can recruit DSPs? Next slide, please. Um, one thing that's very important, and we know this, with the advent of um, uh, social media, right? Over the last 10 years, especially Facebook, Instagram, whatever, there is a boatload. There is an enormous amount of misinformation, of inaccurate information about everything, <laughs> whether it's about COVID-19, whether it's about vaccines, whether it's about um, uh, uh, disability services, whatever you, whatever you can imagine that's inaccurate, invalid information, it's out there. One of our responsibilities, and again, we are so thrilled to be partnering with, with all of you, um, we want to provide you with information that's accurate, that's, in, that's in, indeed valid, but it's also useful. Please use our resources. You can go to our website, nadsp.org. You're going to get that at, the end, that at the end of this webinar. All of this stuff is free. You can download this stuff in terms of periodicals, uh, reports, uh, national uh, uh, surveys. All of this all meant to help you as a provider organization, as a direct support professional, as a family member, as a person with a disability, improve, improve your opportunities for better quality support. That's what we're about. And we want you to have good, valid information. So please look to us for those resources. Next slide. Oh, I like that slide. That's a good slide. That's how you can reach us, www.nadsp.org. Um, I think at the end of the webinar, we'll review this. But let's go to the next slide. I think it's the panel slide. Yes, this is the best part. This is the best part. This is the best part. All right, everybody. We have um, a wonderful panel. 
And this panel is comprised and composed of direct support professionals and the people that they work with. And I have the real great honor and privilege to introduce our panel. Let's start it off. Um, and as I'm introducing this panel, and during this panel, we're going to talk about some of the issues I just covered, but kind of dig down into some personal stories. Um, so let's start off with introducing uh, Shauna Frisbee and Esteban Camacho. If you could come onto the screen, that'd be awesome. Thank you so much. Where are you guys? There you, there you are. Wave to everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome. All right. And you can take your mute off. That's fine. That's totally cool. And you, you are from Community Catalysts. Is that the organization? Yes. All yeah. right. Great. Wonderful. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Next, I'd like to introduce Rosa Vizcano. Don, Paracol, and Jesus Andredi. All right. Where'd my slide go? Where'd my slide go? I need my slide. Hi, uh, Hi Don. Hi, Rosa. Uh, hey. Hi. There you go. There you go. Thank you. And lastly, lastly, I'd like to introduce... And they're in two different rooms, but don't let that confuse you. Uh, Kate Wingert and Rebecca Henderson. All right. And there they are. Wonderful. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Kate. And Rebecca, you can unmute. That's cool. All right. Hello, everybody. Wow. So Esteban, Rosa, and Rebecca are direct support professionals. And... Um, between about five or six questions, we're going to have a conversation. And yeah, that's good. You can get rid of the, the slide there. We're going to have a conversation. Um, and I want you to know that this conversation, I want you to think of two things. One, that definition of quality. How does quality happen? And it happens at the point of interaction. How direct support professionals engage how they relate with the people they support and that's why this panel is going to be so good because you're going to hear some stories about how that happens the second thing i want you to just listen to why we continue to do what we do because all of us know this is not a high paying job all of us know we're not becoming famous being direct support professionals or you know all of us know that sometimes having a disability can be very, it can be difficult in this world. But look what we're doing with these questions and with this group of people. Let's get to it right now. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll ask specific questions because we got a lot of people on the screen here. I'll ask specific questions to specific people if that helps you all. And um, so I'm gonna start out with Esteban and Shauna. Kind of go in order, Esteban and Shauna. Hi, welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, just tell us a little bit about your history together. Uh, just again, keep it you know, short and, and simple, but uh, how long have you known each other and anything else you'd like to share? We've known each other for two years. Uh, yeah, Sean has been a part of our company for two years uh, and I've been here that entire time. Um, I've worked for our company for over eight years now. So I've been here the entire time that she's been with our company. Oh, great, great. Wonderful. And Shona, uh, you get along with Esteban? Yes. All right, all right, good. And did, he pay, did he pay you 10 bucks to say that? No, he didn't. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I know he didn't. I know he didn't. Thank you, Shona and Esteban. Two years, that's a, that's a, good, that's a good amount of time. Next, uh, let's go to uh, Jesus, Don, and Rosa. Tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, you got, you got three. Uh, there's three there. So t tell us a little bit about you guys. Uh, well, I'm Rosa, the um, Direct Support Professional for Services for um, Independent Living Services Program and Supporting Living Services Program. And I'm assisting Dan Perricol and Jesus Andrade. I am with the company for about 18 years. And I have Jesus for about 13, 14 years and Dan Pericol for about 10 years. Wow. Wow. 
Wow, that's awesome. So Jesus and Don, what do you think of Rosa? I mean, 13 and 10 years, that's a long time to, 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 to hang with some. Yeah, Tell us I, about her. Yeah, I learned a lot. We learned a lot of, learned to do math and stuff, uh, division, a bit of what else? Uh, division, uh, times tables, and uh, time, uh, spelling, spelling, actually, uh, and his division, division, division. Yeah, a lot of math, but a lot of work, learn a lot. Well, awesome, awesome, John. That's great, man. Math, vital. How about you, Jesus? Yeah, um, I've been working for Rosa with uh, I've been working with Rosa for 13 with, with me. She'd be helping me, and uh, she'd be helping me with a lot of uh, difficult things that I don't really know, and uh, she's. She's uh she does a great job and I like the way she she helps me out a lot. Good, good, good. Thank you, hey Susan Donna Rosa. Thank you. Great. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. What's that done? Thank you. Oh yeah, yeah. We're, go we're gonna come back. Don't worry. You're not done. You're not done, my friends. <laughs> so, <Not yet>. okay. <laughs> so lastly, but not leastly, it's Rebecca and Kate. And so again, you gotta you gotta do two screens to see these wonderful people. Uh, so Rebecca and Kate, tell us about you know about how long you've been working together, a little bit about you. Okay. Um, Kate, did you want to start? No, yeah, we've been working together for three years. Three years, Kate? Okay. Yeah, so here at the Adaptive Learning Center, um, Kate has actually been with ALC for 20 plus years. Wow. And her and I, I've been here for three and a half years, and she is one of the first people that I started supporting. Nice. Nice. Wow. Well, do you remember that day, Kate, the first day that uh, Rebecca showed up? Yeah, we, I was kind of nervous, but yeah. we click. Yeah. There it is, Kate. You said the word, click. That's what it's about. It's about that relationship that clicks. We're gonna we're gonna talk about that. I love that. But you've been together since. So, so obviously, each of these sets of of of, of human beings, they click because you can't do this work, right? You can't do direct support support, nor can you receive direct support services if you don't click with that human being that's in your life. And so, I love that word click, Kate. We're gonna come back to that word. Um, so here we go. Let's get a little bit. Uh, uh, let's get a little bit specific, okay? A little bit more detail. I'm gonna go back to Shauna, and Shauna. This is the time that, uh, and all of you uh, who receive supports from Rosa and then from Rebecca, but for you, Shauna, uh, Esteban. What is it about him? What is it about? What's your favorite thing about Esteban? And you know what? Embarrass the heck out of him if you want. <laughs> Do you have something? Um, well, like, I like how we do, like, crafts and how, um, the most is, like, interaction, like, how we interact and going on walks and, you know, stuff like that. Right. It's more like ther therapeutic, therapeutic stuff. stuff. Yep, yep. And sometimes that happens without like having to go to like a sit down with a psychologist, right? You know, it's it's sometimes more therapeutic just to hang out with somebody you trust, you know, and whatever craft. What kind of crafts do you do you do? I love to paint, and that is my thing. Shauna's very crafty. You can give her a bag full of random knickknacks and she'll pull it out and she'll look at it. And she, in her mind, she's like knowing what she's going to do with it. Like, and she just surprises me every time. Like, she just, she's very, very crafty. Good, good, wonderful. You can, maybe you can learn, you can learn some things, Esteban. <laughs> yeah, I wish I was. I could paint and draw like her. Hey, it's not too late. Um, <laughs> I, I do I like stick figures. That's as crafty as I can get. Okay. 
Thank you, Shona. Thank you, Esteban. Um, You're welcome. Let's go to, uh, I'm going to go to uh, 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 Jesus and Don. Jesus and Don. Let's, let's go Don, you first, and then Jesus. What are some things, specific things about Rosa that has, have made you click for 13 years, 10 years? Mm, learn a lot, lot to, yeah, learn a lot. So she's a teacher. She's a, yeah, she's yeah. a teacher. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> teacher, 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 Lana. Yeah. Uh, Good. Yes, um, about Dan. Yeah. We specifically uh, start working with him and uh, math skills, like uh, learning. And he's doing a great job, you know, little by little. And the most things that he practice is about uh, solving problems, counting money, and uh, bank account management. Oh, oh, which is so tough, right? That's that's not easy to do. Mm -hmm. yeah, right, it gets confusing, and that's your money, right? You know, it's like it's scary sometimes. Um, but no, that's good. That's good, Rosa and John. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Hey, Sus, what about you? You got 13 years with Miss Rosa. I mean, wow. I mean, what are some things about her that you really appreciate and you like? I appreciate Rosa uh, helping me with a lot of things that, uh, that I don't really know. And um, she, she uh, thinks when I have uh, like a Things that I don't understand, she'd be there and I let her know. And I like, I just like everything what she does. She helps me a lot. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm thinking for 13 years, 10 years, you've got to, you have to trust somebody, right? Have you oh, built yeah. Yeah. over the years? Yeah, I, I trust Rosa a lot. Good. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Susan Dunn. So, thanks. Thank you. Uh, we're coming back. Don't worry. Uh, Kate, Kate, um, click. You clicked with Rebecca. So what are, you got any specific things that the Rebecca does or says or the way Rebecca is? What is it about her that connects you? She understands me and what my needs and wants are. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And how, how does she go about doing that, Kate? What, what are some of the things that she does to make sure that she knows what you want? Like what I want in a job. Mm hmm mm hmm Right, right. What about, uh, like, the, what about things like, I know, like, uh, like, Rosa was, she's, like, does banking stuff, does, and like, helping with... I assume shopping and that kind of thing. Does does Rebecca do that with you, Kate? No, yeah, she helps me grocery shop. I shop and shop independently. Yep. 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 One thing that came to mind with um, Kate, we really get along about music. So mm -hmm. we have a bond over listening to Beyonce. So she always tells me all the time, guess what song I heard? So that's <laughs> one way that we really do relate to each other absolutely the music is critical it's critical it's in art in art like uh, esteban and shauna um art is so and it's, it's it's something that dsps can do often you know um like whether it's in the car driving around with the radio on listen to beyonce you know <laughs> put a ring on, i don't know beyonce i think that's is that her put a ring on it what is it is that beyonce is it I, don't ask. I'm into the. Um, so here's the thing, um, Kate. Um, I, I, I keep going back to that word "click," and I, I, let me ask. I'm gonna ask Kate first. Have you ever had people? Because you've been in your organization for a long time. Have you had direct support professionals that didn't click? Yeah, I was in a group home once, and it just wasn't the right. Fit for me. Yeah. 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 And the, the staff, was it was it hard with lots of staff in and out and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, how about you, Shauna? Have you ever had staff that didn't click? Yeah. 
And what what kind of things did they did, did those staff do that really didn't click with you? What are some specific things? Um, like I didn't really get along with them that well, and we didn't have that like eye to eye kind of like relationship. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. How about Jesus and Don? Have you had staff that you didn't like? No. No? Okay, good. You, what about you, Jesus? Um, Can you repeat the question to Jesus? Sure. So sorry. Have you ever had staff, you know, in your experience getting support that you uh, didn't like? No. No? Okay. Good. I'm glad to hear that from both of you. That's good. <laughs> um, so here we go. I got to hold on. I got a chat thing here. Uh, aha. Um, so this is a, a question. Um, it's coming from Will here. So what has changed in the last 18 months for you guys? With all of this stuff, with whether it's the well, obviously you're in masks, uh, you're you know in different rooms. What has changed? Can can you describe some things that have changed over the last eighteen months? And I'll just open it up to everybody for that question. Anybody? Just jump um, on. I would definitely say just living through a pandemic in general for Kate and I was a big thing. Having to um, adjust our schedule, how we meet together, um, learning how to maintain six feet. That's different. Um, one thing that really stands out is, so our organization, we had a day program that Kate was active in every single day. And because of COVID, it had to close. So Kate and I still met one-to-one, -one, but I became Kate's constant. So the normal interactions with her friends and all of the staff kind of had to cease because of it. So that was one really big thing about just us kind of developing our relationship and just processing through, living through a pandemic, processing that. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Anybody else? Esteban? Yeah, for a lot of our clients, we became their full support system at that time with the day programs closing. Um, some of them, their work, their work, their job sites closed. Um, their outings, we had to stop their outings, um, our gatherings. Uh, we would do parties for them, so they'd have get-togethers, and those came to an end. We'd have consumer advisory committees, and those came to an end as well, which um, they would look forward to. Um, eventually, um, Zoom became a big thing, so um, we got those going on Zoom, but it wasn't the same, um, which, I mean, we're doing a Zoom meeting right now. Um, but a lot of people have gone used to Zoom now. Um, it's kind of become the norm, I guess. Um, but for the clients, it was a big adjustment. Um, I would say for me, just being like having to wear this mask because I don't like nothing on my face. <laughs> and I have asthma. With asthma. It's difficult. <laughs> now you can get so, I would say the mask is the the most I hate <laughs> yep. about the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, absolutely, because because also we read each other's faces. If we can, if we can see, you know, if, if we have obviously, if, if we have vision, that's a huge part of communication, you know. And when this is, you know, that's a huge part of how we express ourselves. So yeah, yeah. and if you think about it, like. All the germs are mainly in your mask because all that germs are in your mask. So technically, you're not really getting rid of the germs because they're also in your mask and 
no matter what, if you're by someone, you're still getting their germs. Right, right, yeah. Gosh. There you go. How about how about your us? Uh, eight, 18 months of this stuff. Yes. Um, the same thing as uh, I believe it's Shana. We're talking about masks. I mean, the big challenge, you know, it's about mask, wearing a mask versus not wearing a mask. Also with the vaccine, have the vaccine or not vaccinated. <laughs> and uh, one of our also job, it's about um, educate our clients as well and explain to them, you know, the benefits about wearing the mask and the vaccine and get the vaccine. Yep, yep, absolutely. Absolutely. So that's a good question. Thanks for that question, Will. That's a great question. Um, there, there was one thing I kind of did like for some of our clients um, that came out of the pandemic, but it seemed to be changing lately. Because um, we do have some clients that it's difficult to take them to the doctors. They, they don't like it, like our behavioral clients. Um, so there was a lot of doctors that they were doing virtual visits or over the phone. So that made it a lot easier. Mm -hmm. um, but now they're starting to see them in person, but we'll see what happens as um, the cases are on the rise again. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I have a feeling, Esteban and everybody, this is my prediction, we're gonna see much more telehealth. I mean, it's, and it's actually can be useful, mm -hmm. said, you know, um, and so that, that's another, another webinar. Uh, but um, <laughs> here we go. I got a couple more questions because we, we only have about uh, 10 more minutes. Um, but I want to get to this question. I want to know a time that you needed. And this is to, this is to I think, Shauna, to Kate, to Jesus, and Don. A time when you had to make a decision. And maybe it was a pretty big decision for you. If you could think of a time when you had to make a decision, how did, how did, um, whether it's Esteban or Rebecca or Rosa help you? Think of that. I see you're off uh, mute there, Shauna. Do you want to, you want to answer that one? Well, like, there was a time where I was like looking for a laptop and like a smartwatch. And, you know, we went to place to place, like looking for a good quality, looking for like not too expensive, but a decent price. And so I had help right there from um, my staff. And that's how, and we made a good decision and a big decision right there because they're very pricey and, you got to look at like the quality they are, you know, how many gigabytes you're getting or how many you want and how many storage does it hold and stuff like that. So that's my big decision I had made. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah. The excellent. And was it Esteban? Did that help you? Mm, no. No, okay. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, it was another staff I was with, but okay. he's helped me before with other things that I've needed help. And Esteban is a good staff. <laughs> good. That's another ten dollars, Esteban. <laughs> <laughs> How about Kate? Hey, How about you? Has Rebecca ever helped you with like a decision? It doesn't have to be a big decision like getting a computer, but any kind of decision that she helped you with? Well, it was one time when we had an ALC picnic. It was planned for this year earlier, and we had to cancel it because it was a big gathering and it wouldn't be safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And has she helped you with that, I guess, disappointment or? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Kind of gets your hopes up when you want to be with your friends. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, you can, you can, you know, kick and scream and yell and throw things, or you can maybe talk to somebody through it. And I'm sure Rebecca was that kind of 
again, because we clicked with her, you know, you could probably tell her, man, I'm really mad or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm sorry that happened. How about uh, Jesus or Don? Have you, has, has, has Rosa ever helped you with a decision? Oh, yeah, I yeah, was shopping. Shopping? Yeah. Yeah, like what? Like food shopping or what kind of stuff? Food, sometimes. Pepsi, drinks. Uh -huh. Everything I had, but it was some kind of, yeah. Okay. Here's, here's a question I have, Don. Um, because sometimes direct support professionals, they've got to help people with their diets and encourage people to eat healthy and all that. I mean, you're, you're a healthy person. It looks like you're pretty healthy. But does yeah. she ever, uh, does she sometimes, you know, encourage better things than soda? Yeah, sometimes. I drink a lot of water, though. A ton of water. Okay. All right. Yeah, I don't drink much soda. Maybe no more than two cups a day or something. Okay. Okay. Um, no, that's that's important. Um, how about you, Jesus? Um, my decision is um, Rosa. She helps me with my medical, uh, my doctors and all that, and uh, everything that you know. Every time when I get an appointment, she helps me with it. Great. Great. Good, man. Good. Let's see here. Is it, I, I don't, I'm sorry. Anybody else? Um, yeah. Yeah, Rosa. Um, I'm done. Um, especially whenever we go, like he was talking about uh, go shopping, like a grocery shopping. We explain to him about, um, you know, make a good choices about his uh, nutrition. And one of the things we're encouraging him, it's about instead, you know, getting junk food, it's about more protein, like uh, uh, more vegetables, including in his meals, and comparing also budget uh, prices. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and Jesus, uh, we explained to him, because it's so difficult for him to understand medical treatments. Uh, he was passing through... Um, kind of several medical uh, needs. And one of our job, it's about explaining Jesus what is the uh, medical treatment that he's gonna get and receive and make a choice about um, if he needs a surgery and the doctor explain to him and so he can make the choice, but we are explaining to him. Mm -hmm. Oh, critical, critical. Uh, that's so important, the direct support role there. Cause that's scary, you know, medical decisions, my goodness. So interesting, interesting. Thank you, thank you. So we got time for maybe two more quick questions and then and we gotta end this wonderful conversation. I'm so sorry, I could do this all day, but um, here's, let's do this. Let's do it like a kind of a, a question. Where do you see, what's the role? And I guess this goes to the direct support professionals. What's the role? How the role of direct support is going to change in the next couple years, the next five years, do you think you're going to be doing different things um, in your role? You think it's going to change, and if so, how? And anybody? One thing, well, hopefully, it does change because we always want to grow more. Um, one thing that I heard you say from the presentation is getting credential. So hopefully within the next couple of years, we're able to be recognized as a profession and get the credentials that we need because this is a very important job that we do. Yeah, absolutely. And from, from your mouth to the ears of the funders. How about you, Esteban? You see... Where do you see the future? If you had a crystal ball, what's your role going to be differently? Um, going along with that, that is something that I have talked to one of our my supervisors about is um, certification in, in our field. Um, so I think it is something that will be done and um, see what comes out 
comes out of it. Um, you did talk about increased funding in, in the field. Yep. Um, so yep. we'll see. One thing that we know, certified direct support professionals, people that have a credential, mm -hmm. stay longer. They don't turn over. They're better at what they do. That's what, that's what we're pushing for. So, Rosa, what about you? What do you th is your role going to change, you think, in the next five, ten years? <laughs> well, it's hard to say, you know, because we keep going forward and every time it's a new challenge coming up. But uh, the, what I'm saying and my vision is about never to stop doing what we're doing. Keep going and keep advocating for our clients to be, you know, uh, because... Um, we are uh, basically their voice, right? We advocate for them everywhere. And so just trying to be better and keep looking for more resources uh, available for them. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so look, my goodness, I've got I've to end our panel, but I just want to first thank you all so much you've you, you just it's so it makes me feel so good to know that there's all these great direct support professionals out there in california and you wonderful people that are are are, are, are making these direct support professionals work for their money um because you know uh i just love the fact kate i'm going to stick with it it's all about clicking with people so that you can do great things and what i heard to, 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 I hear that direct support professionals are teachers, art teachers, accountant teachers, um, uh, 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 counselors, uh, therapists. Um, the list goes on. I think everybody that has been on this webinar listening to this panel understands that the role of a direct support professional, my goodness, it's complex, it's sophisticated, and it's essential. And if anybody wants to take me on for that one, uh, I'll, 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 go out, I'll go out to the alley with you because you cannot argue after hearing this conversation that you're not only essential, you're professionals and you're wonderful professionals. And I'm just honored to have shared this webinar with you. Um, so I'm gonna thank you all. Thank you for the interpreters, uh, the ASL and the Spanish interpreters. I hopefully um, uh, we didn't talk too fast or mumble um but i'd like to give it back to my colleague and my friend uh barry uh barry uh so barry take it away my friend thanks so much john uh big thanks to the panelists you you all were incredible today and thank you for sharing your insights your experiences um, it, it's so impactful to hear your stories. Um, I, I'm not going to sing the praises of D, at, at DSPs any better than John has for us today. But John, thank you for the background, the overview, and for facilitating that great conversation. I hope you all enjoyed it at home. I, I know I loved it. Um, I, 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 as I thank us, uh, our panelists and presenter and close us out, I do want to let everyone know uh, about our upcoming webinar, which will be on September 8th. It is Advocate, uh, from Informed to Empowered. Uh, this, we are transitioning to a monthly schedule uh, for the rest of this year, so I just want to make sure that you note on your calendars. Um, we'll be back with you on the, the second Wednesday in September from 3 to 4.15. You can register at webinar.disabilitythriveinitiative.org to make sure you're there for that one. It should be a great conversation as well. Um, and then we get an opportunity to continue this conversation on that shifting role of DSPs and how important they are in the lives of the individuals that they support. Um, so if you're interested in continuing that conversation with us, please join us on Friday, um, August 13th. That's just two days from now, uh, between noon and one. It's, it's our lunch and learn session. It's more interactive. You can ask questions, um, get feedback. Uh, and and it's, always, it's always a great time um, with those who attend. So please do join us. You can register at the link there on the screen. We also will have all the resources from today's presentation in our resource library. So the slides and the recording of the webinar will be up with as, as quickly as possible, typically within a couple of days. On our website, you can also sign up for email uh, updates about our upcoming presentations and uh, materials. 
and request technical assistance or support for a peer to peer or group consultation to help you develop um, alternative services as we progress through the rest of the year. Um, with that, I will thank you all for attending today. Just a quick reminder that as you close out of your session today, you're going to uh, be given a link to a survey. Please do take it, provide feedback on the presentation today and let us know how we did and how we can improve and how we can better serve you as our community. Um, thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Betty, Destiny, and Mark for your interpretation. Very much appreciated. And we will see you all soon. Thank you so much. Hey. <laughs>